cardiac muscle is striated like skeletal muscle, but its cells are branched and it is an involuntary muscle. You cannot consciously control it. The cells are held together by intercalated discs. Intercalated discs are a combination of a desmosome and a gap junction. A desmosome, you'll remember, was kind of like a spot weld. It kept cells tightly held together, but allowed for movement. A gap junction allows for electrical conductivity between cells. So because the cardiac muscle cells are electrically joined, the heart acts as a unit, like one big muscle. We call this a functional syncytium. Cardiac muscle has more mitochondria than any other muscle type, fewer T tubules, and less sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is where the calcium is stored, so there is less intercellular calcium in cardiac muscle cells. Just like in skeletal muscle, the myofibrils are arranged in sarcomeres. Here you see some cardiac muscle. These dark bands are the cell joinings. These are the intercalated discs. And you see that these are striated just like skeletal muscle. Their contraction is going to be very similar to that of skeletal muscle. Some cardiac muscle cells show autorhythmicity, about 1% of them. This means that they can depolarize on their own. Skeletal muscle had to be stimulated by the nervous system in order to contract. Skeletal muscle could also contract in motor units. That is, the entire muscle did not have to contract, but parts of the muscle could contract, so that you got varying levels of strength of contraction. In the heart, the entire muscle works as one unit, so if you contract one cell, you contract all of them. The refractory period was the time between when a cell had been stimulated to contract and when it could be stimulated and contract again. In skeletal muscle, the refractory period was short enough that skeletal muscle could be stimulated to contract before it had started to relax. This allowed for tetanus, or a sustained muscle contraction. The heart has a longer refractory period. It must be partially relaxed before it can be stimulated to contract again. So the heart has no ability to go into tetanus, which is a good thing because a heart muscle that was in a sustained contraction wouldn't pump much blood. The contractile muscles of the heart have to rely on extracellular calcium for complete retraction because there is not enough calcium stored in the endoplasmic reticulum. Because cardiac muscle has more mitochondria, there is no anaerobic respiration in cardiac muscle. It is all aerobic respiration. But the cardiac muscle can use more than just glucose as a fuel supply. It can easily use fatty acids and even lactic acid. The danger of a poor blood supply to the heart is a lack of oxygen, not a lack of nutrients. The autorhythmic cells make up what are called the cardiac conduction system. The way these cells work is they slowly leak sodium. A threshold is met on the membrane which causes fast calcium channels to open. When these open, extracellular calcium enters the cell and that completes the action potential. The cardiac conduction system, those autorhythmic cells, are clustered into groups. We have the sinoatrial node, or the SA node. We have the atrioventricular node, or the AV node. The atrioventricular bundle, also known as the AV bundle, or the bundle of Hiss. The bundle branches, which go to the right and left sides of the heart. And then the Purkinje fibers, which spread out across the ventricles. So here you see the SA node up in the very top of the right atrium. When the SA node fires, it sends its signal across both atria and to the AV node. The AV node is right there at the crosshairs of the atria and the ventricles. Now the atria and the ventricles are separated from each other by a thick band of connective tissue. So the only way for the impulse to get to the ventricles is through this AV node. When the AV node fires, the impulse goes down the AV bundle and branches to the right and left bundle branches. And then the impulse spreads across the Purkinje fibers, which go to all of the heart muscle cells in both ventricles. This causes the ventricles to contract. The SA node acts as the pacemaker. 
it fires about 70 times per minute. This sets up what's called a normal sinus rhythm. The AV node will fire about 50 times per minute, and the AV bundle and bundle branches can fire 30 times per minute. Now because the SA node fires faster every time the SA node, it clears any buildup that's going on in the AV node or the AV bundle and they have to start over on their buildup. So the fastest pacer controls the heart. In a normal heart, that's the SA node. Arrhythmias are irregular heart rhythms. These are usually due to some sort of defect in the intrinsic conduction system. Fibrillation is when you have rapid, irregular, or out-of-phase contractions. And this can occur on the atria, so you have atrial fibrillation, or the ventricles, ventricular fibrillation. Because the atria are not very effective in terms of pumping blood to either the lungs or the body, atrial fibrillation is much less damaging than ventricular fibrillation. If the ventricles are not contracting as a unit, blood is not being sent out of the heart. The AV node can set the pace at 40 to 60 beats per minute if the SA node becomes non-functional for some reason. This is fast enough to maintain circulation, but if someone puts any stress on the system, like standing up suddenly or walking, this may not be a sufficient rate to keep the blood circulating for that purpose. Ectopic pacemakers occur when cells outside of the regular conduction system become hyperexcitable. These cells can be affected by caffeine or nicotine. If they generate impulses faster than the SA node, then they will take over pacing the heart. Because they're not under any kind of nervous system control, the heart rate can go up to dangerously high levels. PVCs, or premature ventricular contractions, may occur. These are extra systoles, or little extra beats of the heart. The problem here is that this can lead to heart attack. The treatment is to simply burn out these cells, a process known as ablation. Another problem with the heart is heart block. The AV node is the only route to the ventricles. That connective tissue between the atria and the ventricles prevents the impulses from the SA node from getting to the ventricles. The AV bundle and the Purkinje fibers will pace, but only at 30 beats per minute, and that's too slow to maintain circulation. So if there's any damage to the AV bundle or the bundle branches, the ventricles don't get the information to contract. In this case, they can install a pacemaker. The pacemaker may be fixed rate, that is, just beat every so often, or it can be a demand pacemaker that only kicks in when necessary. The basic rhythm of the heart can be modified by the nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system has fibers on the vagus nerve, that go to the SA and the AV node. The parasympathetic system releases acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter, which has the effect of slowing down impulses. The sympathetic nervous system has nerves that go also to the SA node and the AV node and the muscle cells of the ventricles. The sympathetic system uses norepinephrine as its neurotransmitter, and this neurotransmitter increases both the rate and the contractility of the heart. Electrocardiography is a way to monitor the electrical currents that are generated and transmitted through the heart. You get three deflection waves when you look at a basic EKG. The size, the duration, and the timing of these deflection waves are always consistent in a healthy heart. Now here is your standard three-wave EKG. The energy we get when the atria depolarizes makes the P wave. And this interval right here is called the PQ interval. Now, as the atria repolarizes, there's another little energy surge that we would pick up, but the ventricles begin contracting at that time too. And the ventricles are such massive muscles that we get this big spike of electrical energy called the QRS complex. There's a little bit of time in between the ventricles contracting and the relaxation or repolarization of the ventricles. The repolarization of the ventricles is this T wave. And we talk about the QT segment, which would be the time that the ventricles are contracting and relaxing, and this ST segment, which is the time between ventricular contraction and ventricular relaxation. Changes in the EKG pattern may reflect heart damage or problems with the conduction system.
For example, an enlarged R wave may indicate enlarged ventricles. An ST segment that is either elevated or depressed can indicate cardiac ischemia or damage to the cardiac muscle. A prolonged QT interval indicates some sort of repolarization abnormality of the ventricles. This can be a precursor to ventricular arrhythmias. Here we see some EKGs. This first one is a normal sinus rhythm. We have a P, Q, R, S, and T wave, followed by another P, Q, R, S, and T wave. We are meeting about 75 times per minute, so this is a normal sinus rhythm pattern. Here we're missing something. We have the Q, R, S, and T waves, but no P wave. This indicates that the SA node is not depolarizing, so the SA node is burned out or not functional. Also notice that our heart rate is now slower. This is because the AV node is pacing and it's going to pace at only about 50 beats per minute. On this one, we have PQRST, a P, nothing, a PQRST, a P and nothing. This is a second degree heart block. In other words, the information from the sinoatrial node, this little P wave here, is not getting through to the ventricles, so we don't see a depolarization event of the ventricles. We do get another regular heartbeat, and then we get one where we don't get a ventricular rate. And this one doesn't look good at all, does it? This is V-fib, ventricular fibrillation. Here you've got this chaotic EKG pattern, and this means that the heart is not beating functionally. A cardiac cycle is one complete beat of the heart. Now we're going to use the words systole here. Systole has the same meaning as contraction or depolarization. And diastole has the same meaning as relaxation or repolarization. So one complete heartbeat or one cardiac cycle is atrial systole, atrial diastole, ventricular systole, ventricular diastole. In other words, the atria contract and relax, and then the ventricles contract and relax. As we look at the cardiac cycle in more detail, we're going to start with the heart totally relaxed. This is called the period of ventricular filling. When the heart is totally relaxed, it is the lowest pressure point on the circulatory system. Blood is going to flow along a pressure gradient, so it's going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. So there's a natural pull of blood into the heart. The AV valves are open, but the semilunar valves are closed. About 80% of the blood that's flowing into the atria just go right through those open AV valves directly into the ventricles. At atrial systole, when the atria contract, the other 20% of the blood in the atria is forced into the ventricles. Atrial diastole, or relaxation, is then persistent for the remainder of the cardiac cycle. So the atria contract once, and then they sleep the rest of the time. In ventricular systole, as soon as atrial relaxation begins, the ventricles begin to contract. As the ventricles contract, they increase pressure, and this starts to force blood back up toward the atria, so the AV valves will close. We go to a period of isovolumetric contraction. The AV valves are closed, and the semilunar valves are still closed. There's no change in the volume in the ventricles. But as the ventricles continue to contract, the pressure increases, and eventually the pressure exceeds the pressure in the attached arteries. So the semilunar valves are forced open, and blood is forced into the arteries. We then have a period of isovolumetric relaxation. The ventricles begin to relax. That means the ventricular pressure drops, and the blood that's been forced in the arteries tries to backflow into the heart. This is what's going to cause the semilunar valves to close. So once again, we're in a situation where all of the heart valves are closed and there's no change in the volume of the ventricles, that isovolumetric relaxation. Because the blood kind of rebounds off of those closed semilunar valves, you sometimes pick up a little change in blood pressure that's called the dichordic notch. 
Since the heart beats at 75 beats per minute, if we divide 75 into 60 seconds in a minute, we would find that a cardiac cycle lasts 8 tenths of a second. For a tenth of a second, the atria is contracted. The other 7 tenths of a second, the atria are relaxed. Ventricular systole takes up 3 tenths of a second. The entire heart, ventricles, and atria are relaxed for 4 tenths of a second. So for half of a cardiac cycle, the heart is completely relaxed. Since blood flows along a pressure gradient, this alternating contraction relaxation is what creates pressure that forces blood out. And then when we relax, pressure decreases, allowing blood to flow back in. The valves keep blood flowing in only one direction. The right and left side of the heart work at the same time, in the same way, and eject the same volume of blood. A lot of people have the idea that because the left ventricle is sending blood to the entire body, it must send a whole lot more blood out than the right ventricle. But if you think about it, that doesn't make much sense because you've got to have as much blood coming into the left side of the heart as coming into the right side of the heart. So all of those volumes have to remain the same. The pressure in the pulmonary trunk is much lower than the pressure in the aorta. The pressure in the aorta is about 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. In the pulmonary trunk, the pressure is only about 24 over 8. So the right ventricle does not have to contract as strongly as the left ventricle to overcome the pressure in the pulmonary trunk and send blood to the lungs. When you look at the heart, you will notice that the left ventricle has much thicker musculature than the right ventricle. This is because of the way they function. Heart sounds are known as lubbed up. This is the sound of the valves in the heart closing. The lub is the AV valves closing, and the dup is the semilunar valves closing. If the valves don't close properly, then you will hear a little backflow or a murmur. So here you see the valves on the heart. These are the locations to put your stethoscope to hear the various valves. Now this is the aortic valve. This is the pulmonary semilunar valve. This is where you would best hear the tricuspid valve, and down here is where you would best hear the mitral or bicuspid valve. The cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle in one minute. The cardiac output can be determined if you know the heart rate and the stroke volume. The stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected from the ventricle with each heartbeat. In a normal heart, this is about 70 milliliters. So 75 beats per minute times 70 milliliter gives you a cardiac output of 5,250 milliliters per minute, or 5.25 liters. You will remember that a male has 5 to 6 liters of blood, a female 4 to 5 liters of blood. This means that about once a minute, you circulate your entire volume of blood. Cardiac output is highly variable. It has to increase to meet special demands of the body, like exercise. Changes in the stroke volume or changes in the heart rate will change the cardiac output. Cardiac reserve is the difference between your resting cardiac output and your maximal cardiac output, the absolute maximum amount of blood you can pump in a minute. In a non-athletic person, the cardiac reserve is about five times the resting rate. In someone who is well trained as an athlete, that cardiac reserve is about seven times the resting cardiac output. Only about 60% of the blood is pumped from the ventricle at each contraction. The end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that's collected in the ventricle while it is relaxed. The end systolic volume is the amount of blood that's left after the contraction has occurred. No matter how firmly the ventricle contracts, there is always going to be some blood left in it. If we take the end systolic volume from the end diastolic volume, we'll have the stroke volume. The stroke volume is the amount that leaves. The end systolic volume is the amount that stays behind. A ventricle holds about 120 milliliters of blood, and about 50 milliliters of blood is left behind after the contraction. This is why the stroke volume is about 70 milliliters. End diastolic volume, end systolic volume, and stroke volume are controlled by three things. 
preload, contractility, and afterload. Preload has to do with how much the heart is stretched. You will remember that there was a maximum stretch point for skeletal muscle. If you stretched it to its maximum length, you got the maximum number of cross links and the strongest contraction. The heart works the same way. This is called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. The more you stretch it, the greater the force contracting. The volume of returning blood to the heart is what causes the stretch of the heart. This is called the venous return. So anything that increases venous return to the heart increases preload. Contractility has to do with, again, the strength of contraction, but independent of muscle stretch. We have what are called positive enotropic agents. These are agents that increase contractility, make the muscle contract more forcefully. The sympathetic nervous system, the norepinephrine, calcium, and thyroxin all increase contractility of heart muscle. Negative enotropic agents would be those that decrease contractility. Acidosis, potassium, and calcium channel blockers will act to decrease heart muscle contractility. Afterload has to do with the back pressure that's exerted by the arterial blood. Increased blood pressure means that it takes the heart longer to get those semilunar valves open. So the longer it takes to open the semilunar valves, the less time there will be for the heart to pump blood into the arteries. This is going to decrease stroke volume. The effects of hypertension on the heart is that the heart has to work harder to maintain stroke volume. It has to contract more forcefully to overcome the hypertension in the artery and open those semilunar valves. Stroke volume is relatively constant in a healthy cardiovascular system. If there is a drop in blood volume or if the heart muscle is weakened, both of those will contribute to a decreased stroke volume. When you have a decrease in cardiac output because stroke volume decreases, the body compensates for it by increasing heart rate and or heart contractility. Heart rate is regulated by the nervous system, and since this is an involuntary muscle, it's the autonomic nervous system that does the regulating. The sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine. Norepinephrine will stimulate the SA node to increase its rate. It will also enhance calcium movement into the cells, making the cells more contractile or making the contraction more forceful. If we didn't do both, we would only have a rapid heartbeat moving a little bit of blood. If the heartbeat is rapid and forceful, we're going to move more blood and that will increase the stroke volume. The parasympathetic system releases acetylcholine. Now acetylcholine causes the potassium gates on the heart muscle to open and that decreases the heart rate. This has little effect on contractility, so this truly only affects heart rate. The SA node has dual innervation, that is it gets innervation from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. At rest, the parasympathetic system is the dominant system. If left to its own devices, the SA node would actually fire about 100 times per minute. So by having a little acetylcholine being pumped to the SA node, we keep it down to about 75 beats per minute. As soon as the sympathetic system begins to function, the parasympathetic system shuts down so that the sympathetic system can take over. Most of this is controlled by baroreceptors, and baroreceptors pick up differences in blood pressure. Heart rate can also be regulated by chemicals, and chemicals that regulate the heart rate are called chronotropic agents. Hormones can be one such agent. Epinephrine will enhance that sympathetic response, and thyroxin enhances epinephrine. Ions also play a role in regulating heart rate. It is important that the ions in the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid be in balance. Both potassium and calcium levels are critical to proper heart function. Hypocalcemia, or too low a blood calcium level, depresses heart rate. Hypercalcemia, increased calcium levels, will increase heart irritability. This can lead to spastic heart contractions. 
Hyperkalemia, which is too much potassium, lowers the resting membrane potential on the heart muscle. This has the effect of interfering with depolarization and sets up for heart block and cardiac arrest. Hypokalemia, not enough potassium, makes the heart irritable, so we have arrhythmias and feeble heartbeats. Other factors can affect heart rate. Younger people tend to have faster heart rates than older people. Women have faster heart rates than men. While exercise temporarily elevates heart rate, if you exercise regularly, you strengthen your heart so that each beat of the heart is stronger. This can have the effect of maintaining cardiac output by actually having a lower heart rate. And body temperature. When you have a fever, your heart rate goes up to meet that increased metabolism. Tachycardia is an increased heart rate. This is when you have more than 100 beats per minute at resting stage, not just because you've exercised, but you're sitting still. The higher your heart rate goes, the greater the possibility of fibrillation. Bradycardia is a decreased heart rate, less than 60 beats per minute resting. Less than 60 beats per minute can indicate that your AV node is pacing, not your SA node. However, if you're a trained athlete, that lower heart rate may be the effect of having a very strong heart. Congestive heart failure results when the myocardium has been weakened in some way. This decreases the pumping efficiency and causes circulation to not be well maintained. There are several causes for congestive heart failure. One can be coronary atherosclerosis, a narrowing of the blood vessels so that oxygen does not get to the heart muscle. Hypoxia of the heart muscle causes damage of the muscle. Hypertension can overwork those ventricles. Repeated myocardial infarctions means that the heart has a lot of scar tissue on it, that fibrous tissue that doesn't contract. And then dilated cardiomyopathy, or DCM, has sort of an unknown cause. There are several things that may cause it, but for some reason the heart muscle becomes flabby. It may be possible that drug toxicity like alcohol or cocaine may cause this, or maybe chronic infection. This is seen sometimes in very young people for no known cause. Because the heart is a double pump, each side can fail independently. Now, if the left side fails, that means blood is going to back up into the pulmonary circulation. We're going to get pulmonary congestion, fluid is going to collect around the lungs, and you're going to have the feeling of suffocation. If the right side fails, blood will back up in the systemic circulation, so there'll be peripheral congestion with edema. Typically, failure of one side ends up stressing the other side, and eventually the whole heart will fail. If there is heart failure, heart transplant is the best treatment. There is something called left ventricular reconstruction, where they go in and remove the damaged areas of an enlarged heart and stitch it back together, giving a more normal ventricular size. Left ventricular assist devices, or LVADs, are implanted in the abdomen. They're pumps that are temporary and may keep someone alive while they're waiting for a heart transplant. We've toyed around a little bit with artificial hearts, but so far they've been disappointing. They're bulky. They usually have to sit outside the body, and they're definitely temporary. Congenital heart defects are defects that people are born with. There are two very common congenital defects. One has to do with the mixing of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood. In the fetus, it is not important for the pulmonary circulation to be effective. There is no air going into the lungs of the fetus, so while we need to keep enough blood flowing to make sure that system develops, it's not a functional system until the baby is actually born and takes its first breath. For that reason, in the fetus, there are some bypasses to the pulmonary circulation. One is a hole in the wall of the heart that allows blood to flow directly from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. This normally closes up within a day or two of birth, but if it doesn't, then you'll have a septal defect and blood will continue to flow from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart with some of the blood bypassing the lungs. 
This means that the infant doesn't properly oxygenate the blood. One of the other bypasses is a bypass between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. This is called the ductus arteriosus. Again, this should spasm close at birth or shortly after birth. If it remains open, it's called a patent ductus arteriosus. And once again, we have blood not going to the lungs for oxygenation. The other major thing is if there are narrowed valves or blood vessels. One of the more common ones here is coarctation of the aorta. Here the aorta is too narrow, so blood cannot get out of the heart and adequately circulate to the systemic circulation. Tetralogy of Fallot is the most serious of the congenital heart defects. It is four problems that are combinations of both narrowed valves and blood vessels and the mixing of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood. As you age, sclerosis of the valve flaps may occur. The flaps may get thickened and become less flexible so that heart murmurs develop. There is a decline in cardiac reserve so that as you go to exercise or demand a greater blood flow at times, you just don't have it there. This has to do with your sympathetic response to stress. Cardiac muscle will become damaged over time, and since we don't replace cardiac muscle with cardiac muscle, but rather with fibrous connective tissue, the heart muscle may have little bits of fibrotic areas on it. Myocardial infarctions and ischemia increase that happening. And as we age, there is atherosclerosis, a little bit of buildup of plaque inside the blood vessels that make them a little more narrow. Also, some calcium deposits in the smooth muscle of the blood vessel makes them a little less elastic.